Amen. Anybody else? Jam, I've listened. I've gone back and listened to Charles's last Sunday sermon five or six times this week. And it's been such a blessing. Blessing. God has really Amen. been with me this week. Thank it's you. Because of God's amazing love, church. Yep. Amen. 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 God is able, Andy Church. Amen. God supplies us because of that amazing love that we meet here each week to give Him praise, church. We want to sing this song and all it talks about it, man, that amazing love. And man, you look down and you look at us. And no matter what we're going through, no matter what battle we face, man, He's there, He's waiting, and He's loving us. And all we got to do is surrender to him. Amen, church? Amen. Amen. Let's continue worship.
know me and my family. Yeah. What they don't know, what they don't realize, is in 2005, two weeks before I got saved, I was smoking crystal methane on my back porch. That I lived a life of constantly cussing at everybody around me. Constantly. Constantly treating everybody like a dog so I could be glorified in some way. And it changed. Yeah. I called him out. And he took me on that path of destruction. Amen. And put me on that path, that narrow one that I made. Yes. I just praised him this morning. Amen. 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 Thank you for the testimony. Everybody all right this morning? Oh, yeah. It's good to see you. Can y'all hear me all right? That's what I'm talking about. All right. I'll be in Exodus. This is my last sermon on Moses. And I'm still not getting where I want to go, but it's okay. It's okay. Uh, let me tell you this little story. Uh, I heard about this preacher who had his teeth all pulled. And uh, he had new dentures that were being made, of course. The first Sunday he preached, he only preached 10 minutes. And uh, the second Sunday he preached, he preached 20 minutes. The third Sunday he preached, he preached 90 minutes. The people went to him and said, what's happened with your preaching? I just want to know. And the preacher said, well, the first Sunday, my gums were so sore it hurt to talk. And he said, the second Sunday, my dentures were hurting a whole lot. He said, the third Sunday, I accidentally grabbed my wife's dentures and I couldn't stop talking at all. Amen. Amen. talk to you. Um, I got three points this morning and I hope, I'm praying that this is done right. Uh, you know, Pride and deception is so easy to fall into. Amen. It's easy. And before we know it, we're there. So I got three points. Point number one is real simple. Success is very dangerous. It's not the failures in life that can mess you up. It's the success in life. And as, and as I've said the past few weeks, the most dangerous person in the world is a person that's talented, successful, knows what's going on, they're very dangerous. The reason you're very dangerous, or we're, we're very dangerous, is that it's at that time we're most prone to messing up. That's when we're very successful. The danger of success and prosperity makes us think that we don't need God. I had a cousin who was in the Vietnam War, and he said that one day they took a, a, a long trip, and they finally came to a place that was hot that day, the place had shade trees and a stream and grass. And he said, my platoon laid there, we relaxed. And he said, if it hit me, we got to get up. Because this is the one place the enemy would get us when we were relaxing and careful and we got to guard them. That's what success, that's what ease would do to all of us. In Deuteronomy 6, God tells the children of Israel that he's a giving God. And we know that's true, right? Everything you give God, He blesses. Everything. I guarantee you, if you're a believer today, you have more today than you did when you first met God. Amen. Because God is a giving God. But with that success, He tells the children of Israel in Deuteronomy 6, He says, I'm a giving God, and since I'm a giving God, I will give you so much, and in my gifts to you, you become, I guess, ungrateful. Deuteronomy 6, verse 10, it says this. Then it shall come about when the Lord your God brings you into the land which he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you great and splendid cities, which you did not build, notice that, houses full of good things, which you did not fill, hewn cisterns, which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees, which you did not plant, and even you're satisfied. Then he says, watch yourself. Notice, watch yourself after all this, all the success you have. Success will get us in trouble. So when you're very successful, God's Word says, watch. Watch. What do we watch for? Watch yourself that you do not forget the Lord who brought you from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. This is a New Testament principle. It's a, it's a biblical principle. But in uh, Revelation 3.17, he tells the church of Laodicea these words. Because you say, I am rich 
and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, but you do not know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Why? Because we become rich, we don't need anything. So deception comes across its path when, well, we become at ease. Let me move right here and get my stuff. I lost my headset. I guess it's because I became slack. Uh, <laughs> Last time we're going to do this. We know the life of Moses, right? The life of Moses. You should find out. The first 40 years he was a what? <coughs> Very well. Second 40 years he was what? <laughs> Third 40 years he was what? <laughs> he was a success again in fulfilling God's will. So very true. Uh, we have talked about this 40 years. We've talked about this 40 years. We've not talked about this 40 years. All the things you know about Moses happened in this 40 years. That's when the Red Sea, that's when the Ten Commandments, that's when the plagues. But notice, it took God 80 years to get Moses where he could be used. You should feel good good about yourself right now. Right? Uh, so if you're still alive, and you are, the only reason you're alive, and I've said this, God has something great for you to do. And he does. So we're going to learn. So I just want you to know, first point is real short, success really is very dangerous because he was successful, then he had failure, then he learned about life, then God used him in a great way. I want to talk today for the whole sermon about this time. All right? That's where I'm at. 40 years he was in the desert. Number two, God uses everything in your life, good and bad. That's bad. Amen. Isn't that great? Yes. So every good thing, God uses. Think about the most negative, hateful, despising part of your life. And it's not said beside you. <laughs> but God uses it. You know, He'll use all the negative stuff, all the bad stuff in your life. Now think about that. The greatest hurt in your life it becomes the greatest part of healing in your life. Your greatest pain, and think about in your life where your greatest pain has been. Your greatest difficulty. The thing that hurts you the worst. That's where God wants to use you the best. But many times we look at it and we say, I hate that time of my life. Well, see, that's a victim mindset. We're not victims, we're victims. Amen? So God wants to take the worst part of your life. And if you let him, he'll take it, and that will be the place you will minister the best from. It's like this. No one can minister like a person who's been there. The person that can help a person with addiction is someone who's been addicted. He's the guy that can go to that person that's hooked on drugs, that's an alcoholic, and this guy's been set free by the power of God. Well, listen, he can relate with that person, and he can help that person better than anybody else. He's been there, but he's been set free from it, and he's learned. So he knows what they're going through. The person that has been through the death of a child. I can talk to them. But I'm going to find someone who's had the death of a child and say, listen, go see this person if they've come through that and been healed from it. So if you have been healed from that bad part of your life, God can take the worst part of your life and use it as a minister. And your worst part of your life is where you will minister the best. Amen. Not only that, but this game, I mean, nobody can talk to a stroke victim the way I can. I know. I get calls about once a month. Can you go talk to this person? They've had a stroke. And I'll say, yeah. And I'll say, you're hitting this, you're hitting this, you're going to do it. And I'll find stroke victims that's had stroke before me. And I'll, talk, and I'll go talk to them. And I'll say, how long did it take for you, for you to get over your stroke? Ten years? Well, I'm going pretty good. <laughs> yeah. So that's the whole thing. Uh, so that's where I'm going to go. Two people can go through the same situation. You remember me say this. One will come out better, the other will come out better. Yes. One will come out and say, that was the worst time of my life. The other person will say, man, that, was, that turned out to be the greatest time of my life. One comes out saying, you know what? I cannot stand God. Why did God do that? I don't like this. The other person says, man, I give God praise and all the Lord. What's the difference? The difference is you choose your attitude. 
The only thing you really own in your life this morning is your attitude. Nobody chooses that but you. And so how do I choose to come out better? It's a decision that I have to make. I will not become bitter and I will not become a victim. We live in a society that loves to be a victim. We don't. We want to blame everybody. We don't want to take responsibility. It's not my fault. It's their fault. We love to play victim card. And as long as you play the victim, you will never succeed anywhere greater than I because you're always saying, poor, poor, pitiful me. That's right. Uh, so life again. I'm moving on. Life is one word. That word, word, word is what? Decisions. Very good. Decisions. If you make right decisions, Right results. If you make wrong decisions, wrong results. So if, you, if your life today is messed up, it's because of, guess what? Your decisions. Yours. Well, how do I change my life? Simple. Life's not complicated, but we make it complicated. I change my life by making right decisions. Will my life change in one day? No. But if I keep on sowing a right decision, and I have a right decision, and a right decision, and a right decision, sooner or later I will reap right decisions and my life will change because I'm making the correct decision in life. So that's all I have to do is decisions. Now my point is, don't forget my point, because I'm here to preach this. God uses everything in your life, good and bad. Yeah. Let's look at Moses. Let's see if this works in the life of Moses. We know more about Moses in this part of his life than any part of his life. We know some right here from the Word of God. We only know seven verses in this period of 40 years. In the whole Bible, the whole Bible only talks about seven verses in the middle of 40 years of the life of Moses. That's it. There's some on his first 40. There is a lot on his last 40. But it was right here that God made him into a man of God. And we we're only given six verses about it. But God, you will see how God used his life to change right here. I'm going to ask you a simple question. You ready? In the last 40 years of Moses' life, would he be made fun of? Answer is what? Would he, be, would he be hated by people? The answer is what? Yes. Would he be betrayed? Yes. Would he be accused? Yes. Would he be lonely? Yes. Would he think he could handle it? Yes. Why? Because he learned all of that stuff right here. Well, that's not all. Uh, for the past 40 years of Moses' life, he's been in the desert. And so in the desert, here's what he learned. He knew the, the terrain. He knew the mountain passes. He knew the water holes. He knew it all. So when he would lead the children of Israel out of the desert, out of Egypt, they would go into the same desert. Do you think he would need to know where the mountain passes were? Do you think he would need to know where the water holes were? Do you think he would need to know where the uh, places were to camp out? Where did he learn that at? He learned that in the 40 years of his life that he thought was going nowhere. Not only that. As a herder of sheep for 40 years, he knew how to deal with unruly crowds. Would he have to learn how to deal with unruly crowds right here? Yes! Well, where did he learn that from, y'all? He learned that right here in those 40 years. I'm trying to tell you, God will use every part of your life for something great, but you've got to be alert to see it. It doesn't stop there. In this 40 years of his life, Moses learned how to read and write. Moses learned how to set up a government. Moses learned how to legislate. Moses learned how to be a leader. Do you think he would know how to read and write when he has a brand new nation named Israel? Do you think he would know how to read and write? Do you think he would know how to set up a government? Do you think he would know how to legislate? Yes! But where did, where did he learn that? He learned it in the first 40 years of his life. I'm telling you, God can use every part of your life for something 
phenomenal, but the problem with most people is that they go through life and they say something like this. Well, that messed me up. If it hadn't been for that part of my life, if that's not right, you got to say, wake up! I'm trying to use that part of your life to help you in the future for something better. But all you do is moan about it. All you do is complain about it. All you do is say I'm the victim all the time. And I can use you for great things. I can use all the good things and the bad things in your life to make you something phenomenal. And we all know about the deeds of Moses. But these things would not have happened to Moses if he hadn't been for these 80 years of his life that he learned something. Are you with me? Yes. And most people go through life and they don't see it. But right here's a great example how God used all that time of his life to do something. It's like this. Life is a classroom. Amen. Right? Yes. And every day is a class. And sometimes we fail, sometimes we pass. We live in what I call a microwave culture. Uh, I'm 57. Love it. I wouldn't go back to be 15 for nothing in the world. Thank God for 57. Um, but we live in a microwave culture where we want everything done. That's right. We don't have patience. I can't remember. It used to. It, I, I, I haven't ate any pop. Well, I have any popcorn. But I, I, my favorite time it used to be at 9 o'clock at night. Man, glory to God. <laughs> a bowl of Fruit Loops with a gallon of milk and everything else. I haven't had any Fruit Loops since I had this stroke. Okay, I just don't eat past it. I don't, I don't try to eat past 7 o'clock. And uh, Sun Kiss. Man, I love that drink. I haven't had one sun kiss. Uh, popcorn, I used to eat popcorn every night late. I could put that bag of popcorn in the microwave in 45 seconds. Lord, <laughs> it's done. It's all over <laughs> I remember in the 70s having to get out a frying pan, put oil in it, and warm, the, warm it up. And it would take me 20 to 30 minutes to get some popcorn fixed. Remember that? Do yeah. y'all remember? Of course, you have no clue what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> you do this. You used to turn the TV on, and it was a white dot in the middle. <laughs> the TV had to warm up. <laughs> right? So you turn the TV on, and you say, about two minutes. <laughs> and you would sit there and you had enough time to go use the bathroom and everything else come back. It just came up. But it took two minutes to warm that TV up. <laughs> yeah. Wasn't that big of a deal? Um, you used to make phone calls. Now, the phones we have, I hit one button. Call so and so. Or in fact, I just got to say, call so and so. Hey, who does that thing sometimes? <laughs> it's pretty bad when I get frustrated with a machine. I said, said, so, so. Hey, who? Anyway. But back in the day, my phone number in the 70s was area code 919-668-2359. But you have to dial it this way. <laughs> <laughs> And my family used to come from West Virginia to come visit us. And we had the old trick that when you get home, call us up. And they would call us up and say, Is so and so home? We know who it is. They're not home. But we knew they were home safe. We hung your phone up. And they paid for a phone bill. <laughs> Back in the day, microwave culture. See, we want God to make us into the person that God wants us to be. Yes. Like that. And it don't take like that. Don't you believe that God can change your circumstance just like that? Amen. He can't, can he? Yes. But he can't change you.
He's trying to take that circumstance to change you. And we're still trying to learn. Uh, in about six weeks, I'm starting this class up. And what I want to do in this class with those, I'm going to put out my hand on do it. Let's see, we can divide our life like this. Just hear me out. Give me, just give me one minute. Every last one of us have a lifeline. What I would like to do for your life is uh, say you were born here and here's your lifeline and you're not here. What I want to do in that class and say, let's look at your life. We want to mark out some areas in your life, some hard spots, and say when you were in your 20s, what happened? When you were right here, what happened? Then I'm going to say, I want you to take this, and I want you to tell me, what did you learn? Where did it come from? Because you see, God used all of the 80 years of the life of Moses he used all of those 80 years in his last 40 years for something great. And God has done some great things in your, your life, and he can take the good stuff and the bad stuff, and he can make it good in the last years of your life, you can hit home runs. But the problem is, most of us don't sit down and look at life. Does God's word say do that? Yes, it does. Life is a classroom. Amen. Amen. Well, what do I need to be, Charles? I'm not going to preach this. You need to be teachable. That's pretty important. You need to have a servant's heart. You need to be forgiving. That's big. You need to be thankful. Oh, and all things give thanks. You need to be patient. You need to, you need to know the Word of God. And if you don't know the Word of God, you've got to get in the track. So are you with me so far? Yes. Point when you think you can do it, you can't. Amen. Uh, I've been thinking about this point all night. At 39 years old, Moses had all the education and all the learning. He was a military leader. At 39 years old, the book of Acts says, as he was approaching 40, he said, I can take these people. And at 39, he said, I can do it. But at 80 years old, God goes to Moses and says, Moses, I want to use you to take the children of Israel. And Moses says, what? I can't do it. I can't do it. Look at Exodus 3, 1. Now Moses was pastoring the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. Once again, when you're 80 years old, and you're living with your father-in-law and taking care of the sheep, we got a problem. But the priest of Gideon, and he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness to the floor of the mountain of God. I said that sweet, I'll just say briefly. Can you imagine a friend of Moses in college driving up in a 1500 BC four horsepower chariot? And he looks at Moses and he says, Moses, and he sees Moses, he's got shaggy hair, and his face is wind beat and sun beat, and he's got a beard, and it's matted down, and maybe this looks bad, shaggy clothes, and he looks at Moses, and he says, Moses, what do you do for a living? And Moses says, I'm shepherd. Oh, so these are your sheep? Nah. Well, who's early? I'm going to find the Lord. Moses, where do you live? You live your father in law. You're kidding. Moses, at 40 years old, you had education, you had talent, you had charisma, you were a can't miss, you were going to be phenomenal, and you're living your father in law? Yeah. If people were to see Moses at 80 years old, they would have said, Look at that bum! Look at that reject! Look at that failure. He's got sheep doo-doo on his feet. And he's got sheep doo-doo in between his toes. He's dirty and he's filthy and he stinks. He had all that potential, Moses. That might be you this morning. 
You might be in a mess in your life. You might just say, man, I'm in the worst part of my life ever. But let me tell you something. God went to Moses when he was looking that way with sheep didn't do between his toes. And God said, Moses, take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. you got to be kidding. You mean this ground where the sheep's being defecating on is holy ground? Wherever God is is holy, right? You see, when God steps into your mess, He will transform your mess into a message. But He's got to be able to step into where your mess is. And if you let Him, He'll take your mess, make you a message, make it a message for the glory of God. Amen. And so here's Moses, at 80 years old, with captain do and she do do between his toes, God steps into the mess. And man, he does something phenomenal for 40 more years. Well, trust what he's saying. Exodus 14. Then Moses said to the Lord, Please, Lord, I have never been eloquent more recently or in times past or since you have spoken to your servant, for I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Question. Pharaoh is the most powerful man in the world. He has all that splendor, all that military, all that pomp, all that kind of stuff. If I was going to find someone to go speak for God to Pharaoh, I mean, God owns the universe. He can find anybody he wants to to go speak for God to Pharaoh, right? Yes. So God owns the universe. When it, well, in college, and I told you, I'm not going to detail, we know they had classes on how to speak for God. So people want to say, well, when I speak, or when anybody, if, if, if you speak in public at any time, you, you want to have this mindset. Well, I want to be polished, and I want to be correct with my pronunciations. And if I'm going to speak in front of people, I want to make sure that I'm under control and my words are clear and concise. And so I know there are preachers who will spend hours upon hours if they've they got to pray somewhere. And they will write their prayer down. And they will try to get it right. And they'll practice in front of a mirror. And they'll say something like, oh God, Lord, oh God. We understand that you are God. And besides you, there is no other. You are the omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient power. In your great sovereignty, you have carved the world out in the scoop of your hand, and you hold this world in your hand. And we stand today between time and eternity, and we're trying to speak the word of God for you. And dear God, as I speak your word today, I pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that you would have me behind the blood stained in the of Jesus Christ, and help me to take the word of God, and help me stand between death and the life, and help me to proclaim the word of God in thy power, in thy glory, in thy substance. And may they receive all this stuff. And may they see a dying world. And may they see that they need to come to Jesus. I mean, God could have got somebody like that to go talk to Pharaoh. God owns the universe. The point is, when you think you can do it, you can't. God owns the universe, and God, who are you going to get to talk to the most powerful man in the world, Pharaoh? Oh, 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 oh,
Deus. Me. something to offer, you missed the boat. When you think you're something, you missed the boat. When you think you're needed, you missed the boat. When you think you're important, you missed the boat. When you think they need you, you missed the boat. When you think you can't be replaced, you missed the boat. When you think you're the most important thing in Randolph, Davidson, Gilbert, North Carolina, you missed the boat. When you think they can't make it without you, you missed the boat. It took God 40 years to get Moses out of Moses. I haven't even noticed. In fact, is this the New Testament principle? Oh yeah. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, he didn't choose not many mighty people, not many eloquent, not many rich or powerful. He chose the weak and the despised for the glory of God. Amen. I would actually say this. It is probably a, pre a prerequisite that you must feel inadequate before you can be used by God. If you think you can do it, you can't be used. I mean, you can be used. Here's what will happen. Can I ask you something? Why don't people talk? Why don't people talk about Jesus? <coughs> now you're looking at me like start stuff. We don't talk about Jesus. I'm not on Facebook anymore or social media. When I was, you know what people talked about? Yourselves and they talk about the church. Ultra Street's got this going on. Journey's got this going on. First Baptist's got this going on. And we got this going on. 
But well, last night I recall, Foster Street didn't save anybody. Journey didn't save anybody. C4 didn't save anybody. But we don't talk about Jesus. We'll talk about church, but not about Jesus. Do you know why we don't talk about Jesus? Because we want pride. Look what I'm doing. Look what I'm up to. Look where I go. It's about what I'm doing. It's about me. It's about me. Or you don't have a walk with God. So you talk about your kids. And if you talk about Jesus, do you know what will happen? They won't say much to you if you talk about Foster Street or you talk about C4 or talk about Jordan. But you start talking about Jesus, they'll say you're a fanatic. They'll say you're crazy. Let's see, you've gone too far. Go talk about, but see, we need to talk about Jesus. Who gives a rip about Foster Street? Who gives a rip about Journey? It's not about this church. It's about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Yep. If there's anything beautiful about this church, it's Jesus. If there's anything beautiful about you, it's Jesus. It's just Jesus in the morning, Jesus at noon, Jesus at night, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Right. But see, we want to be puffed up. We want to be looked at. We want to be patted on the back so bad that we won't talk about what we're doing. No, no, no. Paul says, Moses said, talk about Jesus. Amen? Are y'all with me? Yeah. Closing. The bottom of your nose. I'm not going to preach, I'm just going to read this. Proud people, broken people. Proud people focus on the failures of others. They'll say, look at them, look at them, look at them. Broken people are overwhelmed by their own need. Proud people desire to be served. What can you do for me? Help me. It's about me, but broken people, they love to serve others. Proud people desire to be recognized. Broken people want others to get the credit. Proud people think what they can do for God. Oh, I can do this for God. And I can do this song. And I can do this song. And I can do something great for God. Broken people know they have nothing to offer to God. Proud people have a hard time saying I'm sorry. Broken people are quick to forgive. Or are quick to admit failure. Proud people give the word of God attention on Sunday. Broken people get the word of God attention every day of the week. Right. Proud people will bless the food in public where people can see them like Pharisees. And watch me bless the food and pray real long so people will look at me and maybe they'll think I love Jesus. The broken people get in private every day where nobody can see them and nobody can give them a pound of back. And that's where they pray. Proud people and broken people. It took God 80 years to get the pride out of Moses. Can God change your circumstance? Yes. But He'd rather change you. Come on, have a big day. Amen. Tell the person beside you, I need to be changed. Let's <laughs> stand. Well, good morning. Good to see you. It's a great day. Got kind of warm in here, I thought. Got a sweater on. It's a little warm. I want to pray. Let's bow our heads. Father Jesus' name, we come before you. Now, I want you to do it. I just want to do something last week. Thank you. Thank you.
remember uh, Wayne Ross came to me before service. You never know what Wayne's going to say, <laughs> which is good. And Dwayne walked up to me and he said, it's right here, like right before service. I said, Charles, God's speaking to your heart all the time. Yeah. Like, I was up here standing there. My old pastor that died two weeks ago, three weeks ago. I remember being about 10 years old, standing in the pews at an altar call, and James gave this story. He said, Preachers and musicians are the most prideful people in the world. And we are. He said, uh, it was at a pastor's conference and was packed out. And the evangelist gave a pastor to the preachers. And he said, a preacher from Korea walked down from the balcony, went to the front of the platform, and had a piece of chalk in his pocket for some reason. He stood, he got the piece of chalk out, and drew a circle. And he prayed this. Oh God, I'm not worried about these people around me. But I need revival in this circle. And let revival start in this circle.